All right, everybody, welcome back to the number one television program in the history of the universe. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown. All three books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today, I'm going to be reviewing Night of the Word. This is book number two in Terry Brooks' Word in the Void trilogy. Now, you may have seen last month my review of Running with the Demon, book number one, which is a great book, by the way. And so I was excited to uh, reread book number two. And we will eventually do book number three, Angel Fire East. Um, that'll be coming up soon. Now, as a trilogy, <clears throat> all these books go together. You know, they look pretty cool. You know, they look pretty cool together. They've all got... Uh, Covers by Gerald Brom, and we'll go over that in a minute, and they all look really nice on the shelf together. So anyway, we'll put those back. And we will talk about this. Again, like I said, let's review the cover first, because you know I love graphic design and cover illustration. We've got um, a great cover by Gerald Brom. Uh, Gerald Brom did a lot of the uh, old Dungeons & Dragons artwork. He's one of the great master fantasy illustrators of the last 30 years, and this is just a cool picture of our one of our main characters, um, John Ross, who actually is the Knight of the Word. And uh, we've got Seattle in the background, because that's the landscape where this book takes place. And so it came out in 1998, so it's been around for a bit, and uh, let's get to it. Um, John Ross, he's a Knight of the Word. Uh, starts out right at the beginning, him dreaming of uh, many different types of post-apocalyptic futures that could happen to the world that he must help to prevent. That is his job as a knight of the world. Now he is a knight of the word. Now he's tortured by all these dreams he has and all these end-of-the-world apocalyptic scenarios that he dreams up, and he's very tortured by it. Um, and so we start out with that, and then we go to Nest Freemark, our main character. Now, Nest Freemark was the main character in this book, and she was a teenager in this book, and she was a track star in high school, and this, that, and the other. Now she's grown up a little bit. I think she's in, I think she's about 20, 19 or 20 in this book. Um, so a few years have passed. Now she's got, still got her fairy friends. Uh, they live in, uh, they live in, you know, modern day america she's got her fairy friends though that are um one is peck he's kind of a ghost ghost like fairy i would he, he's kind of like groot in appearance if you know who groot is um and then she's got this other uh ghost friend wraith who's like a ghost wolf um now wraith has gone missing so there's a few mysteries that we've got to solve right off the bat um uh, we've got a few uh, things jumping back to uh, 11th century Wales. We've got, uh, we learn the history of sort of the Knights of the Word. Um, Owain Glindar, Glindwar, I don't know how to pronounce any Welsh stuff, but it's Owain, O-W-A-I-N, Owain Glindwar. And I think, and that's spelled G-L-Y-N-D-W-R, so... Owain Glyndor was a knight of the word. He combats evil in ancient times as a knight of the word. And um, this legacy has now passed on to John Ross, <clears throat> who's the guy on the cover. And he's got his black rune staff. And I think, there's a, I think the black rune staff is depicted here. Um, and again, he's still just tortured by those horrific uh, futures that only he can see, that only he can stop. Um, he's kind of drifting. John Ross, the Knight of the Word, is kind of drifting through a um, magical... He's a drifter, really, kind of like Jack Reacher. He's the magical wizard equivalent of Jack Reacher, if you ever read Lee Child, Jack Reacher novels. He's kind of drifting aimlessly through America, just, you know, coming across problems and solving them. Like Jack Reacher does, but only with magical and indifferent, his knight of the word powers and his black room staff. Anyway, so, uh, in this book, though, particularly after a very kind of unspeakable act of uh, violence changes John Ross, his personality, he kind of, um, he's kind of trying to build a new life. He's uh, conflicted with everything about who he is, and he's trying to build a new life with this character, a new character named Stephanie Winslow. And um, so we've got that going on. We've got um, 
he's being stalked by demons throughout this um, landscape. It's like, like I said, it's a, kind of like a Stephen King-ish landscape. Uh, not like the Gunslinger or the Dark Tower, but just like anything. This is really, you know, because Terry Brooks is known for his epic high fantasy, like the Shannara series and the Magic Kingdom for Sale series and stuff like that. And this is, this is a prequel to the Shannara series, um, but it's set in a very Stephen King-esque modern day world where really creepy weird supernatural stuff happens um it's, it's like this first book I, it was kind of like a very stephen king-esque coming of age story now the characters are older so we've moved a little bit beyond the coming of age story part but we're still in kind of like that small town small community um feel where just a small town, small community is dealing with a lot of supernatural things, one of which is this John Ross Knight of the World and the, and the demon stalking him. And only Nest Freemark, the young girl, can, um, with her magic powers, because she's got the magic powers, of course, she sees the fairy creatures that nobody else can see. Anyway, she only can only her be the savior of everything. And that's basically the plot in a nutshell. Um, and I didn't really give away any endings or nothing like that. But it's a cool book. Again, like I said, this is Terry Brooks's kind of... This is the... Ver this is Stephen... This is Terry Brooks sort of kind of being like Stephen King. And I think it really works well. I think Terry Brooks does a very good job of writing sort of these modern day horror novels. Although set in 1998. So it's really not modern day. You know what I'm saying, though. Anyway, I give A Night of the Word... Nine point, I'm gonna get nine nine out of ten stars. I, I think I liked the first one a little better. Actually, I liked it. I did like this one better. And then uh, this one um, was still a very fun read. Nine out of ten is a great score. So that's what I'm gonna give for uh, Night of the Word.